Okay, so the question of this segment is, why should we fight? Now, we've been seeing in the news very recently or uh, over the past year, the idea of conscription. Now, I'm sure you guys have done segments on the uh, the topic of conscription, but it's come up again uh, last week. Um, but before we start the segment, I will hand you over to Stella. We have Islander issue number two. Islander issue number two, which means the next issue of Islander. So you can have it with 15 pounds and you can also check our merch. We could scroll down. We could scroll down. <laughs> yeah, we have m coffee mugs, we have t-shirts, we have brilliant Islander merch. And here in, in this, we also have Carl writing, we have Morgoth writing, we have Ren, and we have also Josh Firm and Luca Johnson. Islander, it's best magazine. <laughs> Very elegantly <laughs> Give done. Give it a shot. <laughs> but um, so, recent headlines suggest that Britain is close to participating in a full-blown war with boots on the ground. Uh, meanwhile, the regime is concerned uh, that there isn't enough people volunteering for the military service. Uh, the Telegraph posted this. Civilians must be ready to fight because Britain's military is so small, warns Piers. Boots on the ground in Lebanon or in Donbass? We don't know. It or could both. be either or both or anywhere. Hmm. So in this article, it says... According to the report by the Lord's International Relations and Defence Committee, found that the armed forces, quote, lack the mass resilience and internal coherence necessary to maintain a deterrent effect and respond effectively to prolonged and high intensity warfare and questioned whether the British army is prepared to meet the growing threat posed by Russia to European is Russia security. they're talking about. So they're talking about Russia specifically. Um, so in, so we, I guess we can open up the floor. Um, so I, I, my sentiment is quite clear actually. I wouldn't fight uh, if I was called up. I'd actually rather go to prison if I'm totally honest. Um, the reason being uh, is quite simple really. Why would I want to fight for this regime? So the regime, for me, um, a lot of the previous wars, I'm sure, Bo, you've got extensive knowledge on this, the previous wars that the UK or Britain has been part of since World War II um, could have been avoided, a lot of them. Um, and some of them, I think, weren't necessary, if I'm totally honest. Um, so I'll... Citing examples, I was against the Afghan Afghanistan war and Iraq war as well. Uh, it's caused a lot of issues with, let's say, power vacuums from other political entities that we're continuing to fight now um, because of this. Those are just a few examples. But yeah, I think also the narrative surrounding the Ukraine and Russia conflict as well. Mm. Now, spoiler alert. I'm not a Putin sympathizer, <laughs> nor a Russian propagandist. I don't like Russia. I don't like Ukraine. I don't like either, actually. That's my own opinion. But I wanted to open the floor to the question to you guys about whether, well, why should we? For me, at all times, any conscription or draft is a terrible, terrible, terrible thing. Yes. It's a type of enslavement. Yes. Um... Britain, we, we did it in World War One, and World War Two, of course, but World War One, and that was one of the first times we'd ever done it. It's not really in our tradition, if you look on the scale of centuries, it's not really a British tradition to have conscription. I think there's two different, uh, fundamentally, two different types of war. There's one, like an existential threat. We can talk yes. about, we can talk about uh, World War Two and who was ultimately responsible and who who goaded who into what, at when. But nonetheless, when you find yourself in the summer of 1940 and possibly uh, a foreign army is going to come to the shores of England, yes, then maybe the draft and conscription makes some sense to, to me then morally Sure. at that point. Uh, but yeah, to go and fight a foreign war for someone else under conscription, no, 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 no. No, no, on principle, no. Mm-hmm. Luckily, I'm in my early 40s, so I'll probably be a bit too old. So just from, oh, you're purely, lucky. from a purely personal point of view, they probably don't want me. 
I'm too old and knackered. I've got terrible cardio. Uh, dear Ministry of Defence, my cardio is terrible. You don't, you don't want me. You don't want me. I'll be a wheezing mess straight away. Oh. Um, I'm a smoker. Um, <laughs> um, so, but I do think unless it's an actual existential threat that you're at, these islands are being invaded by, and Putin's not going to invade Kent, right? <laughs> So no, no conscription, no draft. It's it's crazy. What yeah. about devices? Um, oh yeah, well yeah. I put my life on the line to defend devices against what Russian yeah. paratroops. <laughs> they 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 drop a parachute regiment on devices. <laughs> um, I think I think well, there's of course a difference between defending your community, yeah. defending your family and friends within your constituents, for example. Um, you know, defending your home yeah. area. Yeah. Then to be drafted up and be sent to other borders, other people's wars, proxy wars that the establishment have either goaded or purposely getting involved with, um, with regards to uh, not necessarily protecting freedom and democracy. We hear that a lot yeah, yeah. about wars. Yeah. We're here to instill and protect freedom and democracy. No, you're after minerals most of the time. Let's be honest. Yeah. So there's one. So the first point is the principle of the thing sure. of conscription. So that's that. Sure. Uh, then the second thing is, as you mentioned, talking about the regime. Who am I fighting for? I'm exactly. fighting. Okay, I'm fighting the British Army for the British government. But yeah, but though, but on behalf of whom exactly? On behalf of what? Ultimate, trilateral commission. Some ultimate power. Yeah. I.e., well, Washington probably. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Or yeah. or the, on behalf of the Zelensky government? No. No. Not only will I not give my blood for the Zelensky government, I don't want any other Englishman or Brit. Yeah. Or any other Northwestern Europe, anyone really, actually. Yeah. Even Ukrainian men shouldn't be shedding their blood on behalf of that government. One of the most corrupt things of all time. Absolutely. Um, again, that doesn't make me in the pay of Putin no. in, in any way. No. Um, and then finally, I suppose, the last point I would make about it is, um, yeah, just making the distinction between fighting in a foreign field. Mm -hmm. Okay, sometimes that might be, that might actually be, necessary or something like it's very difficult to find truly just wars but if you look at the falklands for example yeah i think that was yeah. like going halfway around the world to yeah. defend those people of the falkland islands who wanted at the absolutely wanted to remain part of um britain the, britain, the commonwealth rather yeah. than under argentinian rule in buenos aires okay but yeah going off, going to fight and die in the donbass for ukraine against russia and here's the ultimate point i was going to make is you know, we could, it was, it was possible to beat the Argies in the early 80s. Mm. No one's beating Russia's army in the Donbass. They have got effectively endless men, effectively endless armour, effectively endless shells, right? Don't go and fight a war. You know, like I said this the other day, Sun Tzu talks about this, Machiavelli talks about this, Von Clausewitz talk, talks about this. Don't get involved in a hot war with someone you can't beat. Don't do it. Mm. Like, we won't beat them on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. Even if they conscripted uh, 200,000 guys and we sent the whole British army over there. If Putin decided he still would want to win, he's going to win. If he decides he wants to use tactical nukes, he can. Like, it's an old cliche, it's in The Princess Bride. Never get involved in a land war in, uh, uh, in Russia. Like, that's a classic blunder. Mm. Right? Never trust a Sicilian and never get involved in a land war in, with Russia. Yeah, no, Hitler couldn't do it, Napoleon couldn't do it. The only people who have ever done it was the Golden Hall, um, was the Mongols. Mm -hmm. The only people ever, really, to have attempted that successfully was the Mongols. And that was more or less pre-gunpowder, or right on mm. the cusp of gunpowder. So nowadays, with Russia, with loads and loads of armour and endless shells and nukes, yeah, it's not happening. Yeah. So, no. Stelios? Well, I, I, re I agree with Bo on the distinction. You, there are wars that are defensive and even existential and wars that are not. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that when you're asking this question, I want to ask, you know, what is it? Now, obviously, mm -hmm. yes, I mean, I, I haven't gone there to fight. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm asking with my, I have already answered the yeah. question. So, but, uh, but, you know, I mean, yeah, so I want to understand more what it is. Yeah, sure. Um, so, so before I think there has only been two periods in history with conscription in in Britain, and that was World War One, World War Two. I don't think there's been any other so. call up. So the idea of fighting for your nation was almost a given before then. 
you would do it because it was a high trust society. You wanted to protect that. You what? had, you know, it was very much, uh, it was just different. It, everything was just different. Or so you were living what? in penury and they could give you uh, yeah. food and clothing. Food and, and clothing and, 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 and booze. Yeah. Yeah, there is um, that as well. <laughs> so, something that uh, I, I hope, if I'm wrong, Bo, you, you can correct me. That It seems to me that we're talking now about conscription, and conscription, yes. in the context that we are talking about it, it requires a, no, a strong notion of individual rights. Mm -hmm. Because the idea that individuals have rights against the collective, be that a nation, be that a, an ethnicity or whatever, is relatively new. That seems to me early enlightenment. Before there was there was never the idea whether you know you had the individual right to not get conscripted and to fight a war like that. It was just you, you are a member of this society. You have to fight for it. No question. We're talking pre enlightenment. Is that what, yes, is that what you're saying? it seems to me. Do, do you think I'm vastly wrong about this? Because there are several implications when it comes to this. Because. We're talking about conscription in countries that have a strong tradition of respect for individual rights. And there are other cultures that don't respect individual rights to such an extent. Mm -hmm. So I think that the practice across history is that people weren't asked if they want to fight wars. Genghis Khan didn't ask the Mongols, do you want to, do you want to join? Mm -hmm. It was, you know, if you don't join, you, you're going to get into trouble. Well, I think the real answer to that is it just vastly depends when and where you're talking about, right? Mm. Yeah. Classic thing that sprung to mind is the difference between the classical Athenians and the classical Spartans, yeah. right? One society is, yeah, all men, all, all uh, healthy grown men are warriors yeah. in Sparta. Yeah. It's not the case in Athens, yeah. right? If you skip ahead maybe to sort of the higher Middle Ages, you know, you would have men at arms where uh, there'll be sort of a, a knightly class, but your average peasant would, would never be asked to fight, necessarily, unless there was a giant war or some sort of existential some sort of existential threat, then maybe. But there wouldn't be just a national draft. Yeah. Right. Still wouldn't be a national draft. Then if you skip ahead to maybe the Napoleonic era wars, again, there was no national draft. Quite often, there'd be criminals, your average man, uh, take the king's shilling. Um, <laughs> Uh, you, you quite often you might be a criminal and you're given the option either join the army, join the redcoats or we deport you to Australia which one do you want, or prison, or clink mm. which one, it's up to you mm. and people take the army, or just also lots of people that genuinely just there was a big enough genuine want to join the army as a career yeah, exactly, and that's, yeah. that's, and that's changed drastically so I guess that moves on to um the next part of this because this is specifically addressing uh, a war with russia or boots on the ground from the threat of russia and i think in the social media age um or the internet age or whatever you want to call it people can now figure out narratives you know we have hindsight bias now with all the previous wars you can go back see what went wrong what decisions were made that led up to that could it have been avoided and the narrative surrounding this particular war, Ukraine-Russia, um, is, is so blatant for, uh, for people to see. For example, um, oh gosh, how do I go to the next Move one? the mouse across to that screen. There we go. So the current reluctance, I believe, that's part of the reluctance anyway, uh, to not join the military ranks, I think is largely to do with the narrative. Um, for example, here is the UK has committed £12.8 billion to Ukraine. That's £7.8 billion in military support and £5 billion in non-military support, according to this uh, government fact sheet. And when you put that into context and you give given the domestic policies as well in, within the UK recently, the first thing that comes to mind is the winter fuel allowance. It's the first thing for me that comes into mind. All these, these billions and billions of pounds being pushed into Ukraine, yet the government won't even heat, like provide heating for our own elderly population. Mm. Right, yeah. And that's kind of, that's going to upset people and that's going to make people say, well, hang on a minute, like that's that's not fair. Mm. Like you've got enough money to send that amount of money to send over to another country for wars, but yet you can't afford to heat homes for our elderly. Mm. Some may have even fought for this country. So there's that. 
there's that narrative there's that hypocrisy or discontent um You're like potholes our roads are filled with potholes yes which would cost a few hundred quid or whatever a couple of grand at it. most to, but oh, but we can give the border we can give Zelensky yeah endless money our border the same thing exactly to the same embezzle. we're yeah. paying i think it was i think i've got it here at some point which will go through but yeah over eight million a day for illegal migrants in hotels and you see that and we're paying into that and you're, you're seeing the discontent just sort of unravel and people are going hang on a minute well what about our own what about us as well yeah. you know i say this sometimes quite often maybe too often but um when the when billions get thrown about, yeah. To to put it into perspective, because you hear you know Twitter cost Elon forty four billion. Yeah, sure. You know um, Elon's got over two hundred billion, and Bill Gates has got one hundred fifty billion or whatever. You hear these numbers, but twelve point eight billion is a giant number. It's huge. The James Webb Space Telescope telescope cost ten billion. Yeah. yeah, most people don't have the money Elon and Bill Gates have. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, yeah. The fact that Elon's got two hundred and twenty plus billion—that's insane. Yeah, that's it's crazy. absolutely insane. I can't even like fathom. He's that. got that's to be approaching. It's like a Graham number. I he's got to like... be approaching one of the richest people ever to have lived. Actually, yeah. now Elon. But um, yeah, no, these numbers—it's a—it's a silly amount. It's a silly amount. It's truly a silly amount. Um, and there's of course other agendas, but the narrative surrounding could this have been prevented? Now you can use hindsight bias, but this is from. Uh, this next one is from the European Conservative, and this was published last year in 2023. Um, and it says, Johnson forced Kiev to refuse Russian peace deal. Now, I think you might have remembered uh, the Russians invaded Ukraine and then offered neutrality, um, f a, a deal of some sort. And we the Western allies rallied with, obviously, Ukraine, and Boris Johnson was part of that deal. And... Um, and basically said no and influenced that that refusal essentially um now that's considered russian propaganda apparently even though it did actually happen and there's of course receipts there that you can go and have a look for yourself this is all sourced by ukrainian sources as well so that makes me that makes you think well if it can have been presented and hundreds of thousands of men from both sides could have not lost their lives there is a possibility. Now, it's difficult. It's hindsight, of course. It's easy for me to sit in a warm studio and say something like that. So I understand. And I'm sure you guys might have different opinions on that. Um, but th there's an option, right? There's an option there. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, if you look at since the conflict began, how many billions? Uh, most It's mostly the United States, isn't it? But also lo lots of other European countries have given the Zelensky government it's got it must be up and around 100 billion or more all, all in all right it's mm. it's sort of crazy money and last summer there was a uh, there was meant to be a big push wasn't there a big ukrainian offensive mm. which came to absolutely nothing essentially on the battlefield mm. anyway mm. didn't retake hardly anything or if they did the russians retook it back quite quickly yeah so it does beg the question where has all that money gone? I mean, Zelensky now apparently it seems to That's be a very, very wealthy person, mm. which is odd because I didn't think he he was all that wealthy before he got into office, and I didn't think the no. office of president of Ukraine pays that much. But now apparently he's an extremely wealthy person. Now, anyway, the point is, it's obviously an embezzlement thing. Yes, it's obviously untold corruption is going on. Mm. So no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go and fight for that. No, no, and people say, people say things like the argument like. Um, you know, like the poor Ukrainians that they've had bits of their country ripped away from them. Mm. Well, if we're going to get down to brass tacks, really get down to it, get brutally, brutally honest, I don't care. No, I don't care if Russia's taken a bit of Ukraine off of Ukraine. No, I don't care. No, so that bit of Donbass is now controlled by the administration from Moscow rather than Kiev. So? No, I'm not going to apologise for that. No, I don't want hundreds of thousands of anyone to die for yeah, that. I, I, yeah, that's that's the moral point, right? You don't yeah. want hundreds of thousands of people to, to perish. Or Putin's a new Hitler. This aggression cannot stand. Well, he's not. That's not exactly what's going on here. He's been goaded by NATO for decades. So, no, I don't buy that either. No, if that's what it means, if that bit of Donbass, a bit of uh, eastern Ukraine has to be bitten off 
by Russia, then so be it. No, I don't care. Yeah, and the map gets redrawn all the time throughout history. In the vast sweep of history, this stuff goes on all the time. In the vast sweep of history, that sort of stuff, it's, it's small change. So no, no Brits should go and fight and die for that. No, we shouldn't be sending them billions. No, I don't support the Zelensky government. Mm. Sorry, not sorry. There you go. Mm. Stelios? No, it's just, I think that for some reason we are constantly asked whether we side with one or another mm -hmm. side of foreign conflicts. And mm. I mean, people have their opinions about, you know, who should win or who shouldn't. Mm. But at the end of the day, you, you can't ask people to go and give their lives for a war that isn't theirs. Mm. And I think that what is also particularly bound to generate resentment and it did generate resentment is to if, if you just make the decision for your own people as a politician without even asking them mm. whether they want to fund the forever wars sure how many men uh, ukrainian men is gonna is zelensky gonna throw into that meat grinder mm. how no how many and uh, like a whole generation ruined yeah and that's not enough will a million deaths be enough for zelensky no we'll need boots from other countries now to throw into that endless meat grinder that he cannot win i mean yeah if i've got any sympathy and of course i've got some sympathy it's with the people that have died needlessly yeah both yeah. ukrainian and russian soldiers yeah. not to mention ukrainian civilians yeah of course uh, yeah. i care about that mm. but but where the line on the map is mm. who administers what politically yeah. i'm an englishman i don't care about that mm. they've they've wasted lives zelensky and the Western government, someone like Boris, mm. someone like Biden, the chiefs of staff in the Pentagon, people like Victoria Newland in the State Department, and Putin, and Putin. And Putin, yeah. They've got the blood of hundreds of thousands of men on their lives. Yeah. And, and not just men, women and children as well, civilians. It's all, that is yeah. obviously a tragedy. Don't get me wrong, of course, yeah. I, of course that's a tragedy. Yeah. But where the lion is on the map, it wasn't worth those deaths. It can never be worth them, those deaths. It's not worth one more death. I, I think... I mean, I don't like talking about the war, and everyone who has watched me in segments about about this may, may have already seen this. But mm. because to me, I mean, there are so many things to talk about the war, and so many assumptions that you you require hours to sit down and actually uh, figure it have out. a good conversation with people about it. Because, for instance, I think we have a tendency of looking at it as entirely top down, and I mean, I know several Ukrainians who who aren't particularly thinking that it's Zelensky who made us do it. They want to fight the war. But, you know, I don't know what, what kind of sample is this. But honestly, I think that we, we don't know this. And because we don't know so many things about it, it's really weird that we are being asked to just instantly take an existential choice about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, well, there was it's that not something I know that much about. There was that very long interview that Tucker did with Putin, right. where Putin started his narrative in the 10th century. <laughs> right. And that's not ridiculous right. at all to start the narrative there, not 2014. And I did an interesting bit of content with Apostolic Majesty, whose uh, historical knowledge is absolutely vast. We did a two hour plus conversation breaking down Tucker and Putin's conversation. And again, again we started in the, about the 10th century. And that's really, honestly, where it probably should begin. The relationship between Kiev and Moscow and Novograd and the nature of mm. Russia and, and Ukraine. Um, you know, even if you go from the Soviet era to the present day, even that is quite low resolution, right? So to say that Russia should not, cannot, on principle, control the Donbass, no. No, I'm not, no, I'm not buying that. There's, there's nothing, there's nothing um, set in stone for all time that Ukraine's borders have to be where they were in 2014. It's different. Um, well, in regards to agendas, because I, I think the, the point of this was the narrative behind this specific war. It's not, it's not just about Ukraine specifically. And I know I spoke a little bit earlier about minerals. Well, Lindsey Graham, being one from America, um, has said that Ukraine has trillions of dollars worth of critical minerals in their country. 
and that he doesn't want to give that over um, to Putin and China. That's um, his call, is it? Yeah. <laughs> and I think people are starting to see through that, that it's a lot more than just borders. I think Lindsey Graham is a, a disgusting person, mm. a mad war hawk, mm. mad war hawk. Again, is a million lives enough mm. for Mr. Graham? Mm. How many men need to die, Lindsay? Mm. Yeah. Right? Just so you can keep the, the, the line on a map. What's interesting, he says in this specific clip, um, I don't know if we can play just this clip, if that's possible. Uh, what did Trump do to get the weapons flowing? He created a loan system. They're sitting on 10 to $12 trillion of critical minerals in, in Ukraine. They could be the richest country in all of Europe. I don't want to give that money and those assets to Putin to share with China. If we help Ukraine now, they can become the best business partner we ever dreamed of. That 10 to $12 trillion of critical mineral assets could be yeah. used by Ukraine and the West, not given to Putin and China. This is a very big deal how Ukraine ends. Mm -hmm. Let's help them win a war we can't afford to lose. Let's find a solution to this war. But they're sitting on a gold mine to give Putin 10 or 12 trillion dollars of critical minerals that yep. he will share with uh, China is ridiculous. I, I want so he's just playing a game of risk. Yeah, so it's just a that's, game, that's, to, isn't it? That's literally how, how I see him viewing that. Yeah. And it's and like you said, hundreds of thousands, so many men of of, of perish it's so sad and i feel really really like i don't know just the ukrainians being like slaughtered basically mm. Mm. as well as russians a generation um, ruined yeah uh, over minerals he doesn't care. That, he doesn't there's care there's another the argument i've heard about this and mm. it, it's it isn't about minerals it's about food because a lot of food for Europe is produced yes, the in grain. Ukraine. Yeah, grain and as the well. The argument goes like this: that if Putin controls Ukraine, mm -hmm. he can have his power over Europe is going to rise exponentially because he can also utilize his power as a energy giant, mm -hmm. but also someone who who could potentially cause a, a food crisis. But yeah, Lindsey Graham is talking about the minerals here. But I'm just saying yeah, the argument. There's another argument. Yeah. Um, in terms of like, I'm talking mostly about the narrative surrounding um, the conflict. I mean, the People narrative kind of going. The narrative it to. was just imposed top down. No one was yeah, ever asked. Exactly. And that's why a lot of people yeah. are being very critical. Are upset. No yeah. one was asked. No one was said anything about it. No one c had the right to to criticize anything. So, it, and we are conflating a lot of things because mm -hmm. it's one thing to ask whether Ukrainians have the right to, you know, it's right for them to defend themselves. And quite another thing to ask whether people should, without being asked, mm. be forced to fund a foreign war. Mm. I think it's because a lot of people are, have resentment over the latter, over the government's reaction. It's an elite. The latter, they, yeah, they, that that's all they see, mm. and it's it's ex to be expected. That what would what these politicians expect if they force people to fund a war that isn't theirs? Mm. Yeah, they would feel resentment. Conscription in the draft is is obviously would be massively massively unpopular. If you look at yeah. the United States in Vietnam, yeah, when they eventually brought in the draft for that, mm. well, it, it that sort of really really damaged America in all sorts of ways. It was under Nixon. And the Nixon White House was quite literally under siege for weeks on end, not sort of a medieval siege, but like students just surrounded and, and draft protesters surrounded the White House for weeks and weeks on end. Mm. They got in loads of old buses and barricaded the roads for weeks on end. Um, it ripped apart American society to a degree, yeah. the draft. Uh, because it was such a, a fa it was a fairly unjust war. Well, we don't get into that with Vietnam because... Yeah. Anyway, that's a whole different story. The draft is unpopular. Very unpopular. And this will be, of course, as well, the massively, most. massively unpopular. Yes. No one's going to be, no one's chomping at the bit to go no. and fight and die for Zelensky. And I think to end the segment on that note, I think it's almost like a test, testing the waters. That's why you're seeing a lot of these headlines about conscription and everything. It's almost like testing the public's reaction. And the vast majority are saying, 
I don't want to fight for the Trilateral Commission or the Tony Blair Institute or uh, the, I don't know, people who are even saying the WEF, people like that. Um, no, because this is an elite problem. This is the establishment problem. And we're all pawns in this game. And it's so sad. It's genuinely just sad. And people have, are fatigued from from wars. We don't. We just don't want it. Just Boots don't on want the it. Ground. Go and fight and die in the Donbass Four on behalf of some faceless, nameless war planners at mm. the State Department in mm. DC and the Pentagon. Mm. I don't know these people. I don't know what's what's in their heart and soul and in their mind, what their motivations are, who pulls their strings. But we've got to be conscripted to go and fight and die in Eastern Europe. Mm. Yeah, no thanks. Mm. No pass. That's a hard pass. Cheers. Yeah. I hope you appreciated that segment from the podcast The Lotus Eaters and if you want to see what else we're putting out you can follow Bo's series Epochs this time he's talking about Pompey and Caesar very important topic that and if you want to follow everything else that we're putting out you can follow our Twitter account thank you very much for watching and goodbye <laughs> <laughs>